In 1954, three social psychologists infiltrated a doomsday cult, which believed that on the 21st of December 1954, the world would end and that the cult members, however, would be saved by a flying saucer. And what followed came to define our understanding of human psychology. There is a widespread myth in society that if you just apply superior reason and logical argumentation, you might actually be able to change the opinions of others. This is, to a large extent, not true, and as you might have experienced countless times with either yourself or others, when it comes to changing people's opinions, for some reason, presenting evidence and rational arguments is often not enough. And in this video, I'm going to tell you why. In 1954, the three social psychologists, Leon Festinger, Henry Rieken, and Stanley Schachter, decided to infiltrate a doomsday cult called the Seekers, or the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays. Led by Dorothy Martin, a housewife who claimed to have received messages from extraterrestrial beings, the cult members believed fanatically in a forthcoming apocalypse where a great flood would destroy the world. This event was to occur exactly on December 21st, 1954, and according to the cult, on that same day, a UFO would come to save the true believers at Dorothy Martin's home in Oak Park, Illinois. The objective of the three psychologists was simple, to observe exactly what was going to happen to the cult members once they had to realize that the world was not going to end. And what followed was incredible and provides an answer to why you might yourself find that the world does not respond as much to the powers of rationality as we seem to have been promised since childhood. Now here's what happened. The cult members gathered at Martin's house on the night of December 20th, 1954, fully expecting to be saved from the catastrophic flood that Martin had predicted would occur. The group had been told through Martin's received messages from extraterrestrial beings that a flying saucer would come to this specific location to rescue the true believers just before the disaster struck. Of course, this belief was part of the intense commitment and faith that the members had in the messages that Martin claimed to receive from outer space entities. Leading up to midnight, the group was confident and demonstrated strong belief in Dorothy Martin's predictions. They had gathered at her home, some having quit their job giving away money and possessions, and they were all waiting eagerly for a spacecraft to save them from the predicted flood. As the clock struck midnight and nothing happened, there was a noticeable initial shock and confusion among the group members. Initially, they started discussing whether their clocks were accurate, and at 12.05 a.m., someone realized that another clock in the room only showed 11.55. So, of course, it's not yet midnight, that's why. Until, of course, the last clock struck midnight and nothing happened. Now, the absence of the predicted event led to a tense atmosphere atmosphere as the reality began to clash with their deeply held beliefs. The first few hours after the failed prophecy were marked by anxiety and disbelief. Dorothy Martin herself appeared bewildered and started to cry as the appointed time passed without any sign of the extraterrestrials or a spacecraft. So of course here we did see something which could resemble an acceptance of reality. Which however did not last long. Because what quickly started to happen was that instead of accepting that the prophecy was false, the group members in their bewilderment and anxiety started to search for explanations that could reconcile the disconfirmation with their beliefs. After several hours of waiting, in the early hours of December 21st, Dorothy Martin claimed to receive a new message from the extraterrestrials. This message proclaimed that the world had been spared from the cataclysm due to the strong faith and actions of the group. And the strangest thing is that instead of disbanding after the prophecy failed, the group's commitment to their beliefs was paradoxically strengthened by the disconfirmation. Energized by the new message, they felt their faith had saved the world, leading them to actively start seeking new followers. The cult gained renewed vigor, attempting to spread their message and the story of their success in averting the apocalypse through their faith. As the psychologists later described, the aftermath of the failed prophecy saw the group become more cohesive, with members supporting each other in their continued belief. The event and the group's reactions attracted media attention, which despite the negative publicity, of course helped them to further propagate their message. In their subsequent work, When Prophecy Fails from 1956, the psychologists proposed an idea which has later come to define the way we think of the human capacity for rationality. Namely, that if you believe something strongly in such a way that it is tied firmly to your identity, when confronted with disproof of your beliefs, you will experience what is referred to as cognitive dissonance, which is accurately defined as the psychological discomfort you experience when you hold two or more conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes simultaneously. And the result is that even when confronted with overwhelming evidence, humans tend to not change their beliefs. 
Instead, they actually tend to double down on their beliefs, something which is known as the backfire effect. We basically tell ourselves stories to justify what we already believe. And of course, we all know this from our own lives. What happens when you say something to another human being that threatens with creating cognitive dissonance? What happens when you confront somebody with an idea, observation, fact, whatever you want to call it, which threatens with creating a rift between that person's already held beliefs, values, and their behavior? Well, first of all, you will experience that people simply do not change their deeply held beliefs. And to understand why this is the case, we first need to understand exactly what happens when people experience cognitive dissonance. Based on the doomsday cult case that we talked about earlier, Festinger in 1957 published his theory on cognitive dissonance, where he suggested that human beings have a natural tendency to strive for internal consistency within their cognitions, which include beliefs, attitudes, and knowledge. Basically, when two or more cognitions are in conflict, people tend to experience psychological discomfort. And because it is our nature to minimize both physical and psychological discomfort, we will be motivated to try to remove the discomfort by removing the original conflict. So how do we do this? Well, let's say that you have a deeply held belief about how the world works and suddenly you're confronted with indisputable evidence that this is not the way the world works. You will now experience an internal conflict. So how do you deal with this? Change your original view of the world, admit that you were wrong. Of course not. Rather, you will try to reason with yourself. For a clear example, let's take binge drinking behavior. This is something that you might have experience with yourself or at least something that you have observed others do. Going out on a Friday night to drink with your friends, partying, trying to find somebody to hook up with serves as a textbook example. You know that it's unhealthy to drink a lot. You know that it kills your brain cells and you know that alcohol contains very high amounts of empty carbs, etc. And based on what we know today, no one in their right mind will claim that going out to drink every weekend is healthy and will increase your lifespan. So what happens when we are confronted with this fact? That what we are doing every Friday and Saturday Saturday night is essentially self-destructive behavior. Now here you hold two conflicting views. Number one, I want to survive. I want to live for a long time and be healthy. Number two, I want to go out to drink right now. I want to be social, have fun, get lucky, etc. And what do we do? Do we change the view that alcohol consumption is unhealthy? No, we don't because it's pretty difficult to dispute. Well, do we change our behavior then? No, because that would mean sacrificing pleasure. What the theory instead suggests is that we start reasoning with ourselves. We start telling stories to ourselves which justify our behavior. We might tell ourselves that actually drinking is not that bad or actually I don't drink that much and at least I drink less than that guy over there. Relax, I'll go for a run tomorrow. And by the way, everyone else is doing it. Or maybe we'll just tell ourselves that drinking is better than other habits such as smoking, drug abuse, etc, etc. Basically, whatever will minimize the psychological discomfort will be used. And anyone who's trained in logical reasoning will see instantly that all of these are logical fallacies. But it doesn't matter because the mind, the identity, will go to great lengths to save itself from the pain of cognitive dissonance. Now, another thing that you might have experienced from others if you threaten them with cognitive dissonance is that they respond aggressively. Like, for instance, let's say that you suggest to a woman who just had an abortion that abortion is murder. Of course, this statement might be true or false depending on your personal beliefs and assumptions. And of course, anyone could choose not to believe that statement and just express disagreement in a calm and civilized manner. But the way cognitive dissonance works is that the mere threat of creating a mental rift between, for instance, values and behavior is enough to lead people into a survival mode mindset where they will attack anyone who represents the threat of cognitive dissonance. You have to remember that all of our firmly and deeply held beliefs are a part of our identity. So just as we prepare to fight ferociously to protect our physical survival, it is perfectly logical that we're also prepared to fight for our mental survival, for the survival of our identity. We see this very clearly when people hold strong political and ideological beliefs. When you attack or challenge these beliefs, even in an intellectual manner, it is common to experience that people, rather than dealing with your arguments, will attack you on a personal level. And these types of experiences become even more common the more extreme people are in their political or ideological views. This could potentially be explained by the fact that people who have radical or very strong ideological affiliations, for instance, tend to identify more strongly with their convictions on a personal level. Whereas people who have more moderate views or people who are more agnostic tend to identify less with their views on a personal level. This is one of the reasons why it is often hardly possible to discuss issues such as climate change, gender politics, racism, etc. with especially young people on the radical left side of the ideological spectrum. If you are to any extent critical of the left-wing narratives that dominate these topics, you should basically prepare for impact and prepare to be lynched. Now, the textbook example of this, of course, occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic, where people's opinions and beliefs about things such as the extent of lockdowns, vaccines, etc. were directly linked to their survival instincts. 
instincts. Having convinced their populations that they were all going to die from a disease which were barely worse than the common cold or the seasonal flu, discussion concerning vaccine mandates could literally tear apart families because people became so personally invested in their stance on these issues. Now, the last thing that I want to mention here is something that is probably more relevant than it has ever been before when it comes to being confronted with evidence that challenges your beliefs. And that is the very obvious fact that people tend to avoid dissonance altogether. We live in a world which is becoming increasingly polarized. Growing ideological divides combined with an increasing emotional attachment to your own cause and hatred for the opposing side makes way for one of the worst consequences related to cognitive dissonance, namely that people will literally try to escape it. And what is the easiest way to escape cognitive dissonance? It's simple, by avoiding all information that is contradictory to your current views. And so we see the formation of echo chambers. Now, if we were truly driven by reason, we might just expose ourselves to all the counter arguments to our own beliefs. And in the end, the truth would prevail. And don't get me wrong, some people really try to do that. And if you're one of those people, good for you. But the fact is that it is much easier and therefore much more tempting to just hide away or at least only expose ourselves to arguments and examples that confirm our current view. And as I said earlier, we become aggressive when others challenge our views. And just as before, we tell ourselves stories to justify not listening to people who disagree with us. Remember, if you were of the impression that everyone were reasonable, reliable and logical human beings, you might feel a little bit bad not listening to them or keeping them out of the conversation. You might even feel inclined to having an open mind. Therefore, in the polarized climate of modern day politics, we see how people start aggressively claiming that not only is the opposition wrong, but their arguments should not even be taken into consideration because they are idiots, corrupt and bad human beings, that they are all lying and cheating and that their opinion therefore has no validity and does not have to be dealt with in a logical manner. Again, all clearly logical fallacies. I mean, the opposition might indeed be completely wrong. But if this is the case, you should be able to apply the instrument of reason and prove it beyond any doubt. In my opinion, rather than hiding ourselves away from being exposed to opposing views, we should invite even the darkest and most deranged opinions and ideologies, such as Nazism and communism, to debate with us so that we as free individuals may actually develop the cognitive abilities and rational arguments to fight these ideas whenever they choose to present themselves. Something that I will touch upon in another video shortly. Now, it's important to remember that logic is not something that will always in itself just take you to the true answer of any question. Because any chain of reason will always be based on assumptions. And sometimes these assumptions are arbitrary. Like for instance, with the example of abortion that I mentioned earlier, the question of whether abortion is murder has nothing to do with religion, political or ideological views, etc. And two individuals, both applying a logical chain of reasoning, can reach very different conclusions if they disagree on one significant assumption, namely whether a fetus should be regarded as a human being. Likewise, despite claims from either side of the discussion, it is impossible to use rational arguments to either prove or disprove the existence of God. Furthermore, when experiencing cognitive dissonance, what the doomsday cult case taught us earlier, and what later studies of cognitive dissonance suggest, is that when there is a discrepancy between what people believe and identify with, and what they actually do, or if something is threatening their deeply held beliefs, something of course needs to change, but it is rarely their beliefs. Now the thing is, we might look to cases like that of the seekers and laugh at those people because they faced with clear evidence that they were wrong, actually ended up doubling down on their beliefs. And this is actually sometimes the problem with extreme and caricature cases such as these. While it might clearly display the phenomenon that we're looking for, it also tends to give the impression that the phenomenon happens only to people of the animalistic type. People who are obsessed, fanatic, dumb, believe that they receive messages from aliens, etc. And everyone watching or reading about that case might think, that's not me. I'm a civilized, intellectual human being trained in critical thinking and rhetoric. So of course, I would never fall into a trap like that. But the thing is, this is a phenomenon which occurs all the time to even the best and brightest because it is deeply rooted in the consciousness. And therefore, each and every one of us will be guilty of it from time to time. And it takes a special type of training and a special type of personal drive to even to a small extent overcome this urge to escape or destroy whichever person claim or piece of information challenges your deep personal beliefs. The truth is, this fear of a rift between your beliefs and your behavior or your beliefs or your attitudes is the master of us all. And the way out of it is simple, but not easy. Expose yourself to mental adversity. Converse with people, discuss with people, debate with people. Attend meetings, conferences, seminars with people who present arguments that radically contradict your views. 
and do not be afraid to be brainwashed. I'm not saying that all of your current ideas and opinions are wrong and that you should just give them up like that. I'm not even saying that you should necessarily keep an open mind. But if you truly wish to have your opinions built upon a strong foundation rather than quicksand, it is important that they are founded on reason. And as any other muscle or skill, the ability to reason must be trained on a daily basis and increasingly challenged against more and more dangerous opponents. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, if you agree with my arguments or if you disagree with my arguments, remember to subscribe in order to show everybody how important this conversation is and if you want to join the conversation don't forget to leave a comment i'm always up for a good discussion otherwise until next time